the sight of one sun setting, another sun rising. That is how John Adams described his inauguration day. There is no other office like this in the land that for more than 200 years has seen occupants peacefully step away from the office on inauguration day. The second president of the United States was a fiercely independent, strong-willed man and one of our founding fathers. He was born in a small town south of Boston into a family with deep roots in Massachusetts. After graduating from Harvard, he became a lawyer and was well on his way to becoming one of the greatest scholars the nation has ever known. Early on, he immersed himself in the Patriot cause. As a person descended from the Puritans, he understood that he was a man who came out of a revolutionary tradition. Thus, revolution was to him as natural as getting up in the morning and going to sleep at night. But Adams was a man who believed in change within the rule of law. And after British troops gunned down a mob in what came to be known as the Boston Massacre, it was John Adams, despite public sentiment, who believed the British soldiers responsible ought to get legal counsel. Adams won the case. The British captain was acquitted. John Adams went on to serve as a delegate to the First Continental Congress in 1774 and then the Second Congress, where in 1776, along with Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Thomas Jefferson, Adams was appointed to draw up the Declaration of Independence. About the Declaration, Adams wrote to his wife Abigail, I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. I am well aware of the toil and blood and treasure that it will cost us to maintain this declaration. The Revolutionary War was on, and during this time, Adams was sent to Europe, where he served in Holland and France in diplomatic roles. In France, it was anarchy in 1781. Thousands died in the Civil War and subsequent reign of terror. Throughout this period, Adams worked to secure American independence in the eyes of the world. Out of this, he begins to formulate what is the clearest and most distinct element of his own sense of the world coming. He speaks for the American interest. And one of the consistent attributes of his position in diplomacy was to understand that whatever the United States did, it should never, ever allow itself to become a pawn in the international chess game. Adams returned to America in 1788 and in the following year became vice president under Washington. It was a frustrating experience. He said, in esse, using the Latin word being, in being, I am nothing. In passe, meaning in potential, I am everything. And that's the story. Overshadowed by Washington during the eight years he served under him, Adams, a proud man, bided his time, knowing his time would come. The first presidential campaign, the nation's first real election battle, was in 1796. Adams, the Federalist, was opposed by Thomas Jefferson, the Republican. John Adams won the election, and George Washington stepped down. It was an immensely important event. He surrendered power without force. He stepped down without a coup, without an effort and any kind of threat. Establishing the principle that power is transferred within the presidency peacefully. But Adams took office in an atmosphere of discord. The XYZ affair caused a crisis of hysteria at home. It all started when a three-man American Peace Commission went to France and was subjected to a bribe. President Adams was outraged and began to prepare for war. Vice President Thomas Jefferson charged Adams with inventing an excuse for war. Hysteria over XYZ continued to grow, and in 1798, an undeclared naval war began. 
the first undeclared presidential war. And though it never became a full-blown war, Adams was hailed a national hero for his strong actions. Given his long diplomatic service, he recognized what is a core constant in all subsequent executives, that the fusion in one man of the power to command the military combined with effective control of foreign policy means that in wartime or in events involving the external world, the president is essentially autonomous. It was in the highly charged climate following the XYZ affair that Adams was able to push and pass the Alien and Sedition Acts. It made scandalous and malicious writings against the government illegal indisputably a way for Adams to silence the Republican opposition. It also reflected Adams' idea that foreigners should not have a right to come into the country and denounce incumbent presidents or interfere in American politics. The rest of his term was filled with internal disputes and problems. And in the election of 1800, he was defeated by his political foe, Thomas Jefferson. For Adams, it was a major blow. What you're getting in John Adams is the uh, formulation of what is to be the critical constant of the way in which American uh, politics is defined in the earliest phase of our history, and that is a politics of deference in which the governed shall have the privilege of deferring to their betters by choosing them to, in short, govern them. In some ways, it's a reformulation of that classic definition of Puritanism where you have a speaking aristocracy and a silent democracy. John Adams died on July 4th, 1826, Independence Day, and the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Number two, John Adams, Federalist, 1797 to 1801. 61 years old, from Massachusetts. If you think about following George Washington, how does one follow a person who is the American Cincinnatus? Oh my God, can you imagine how poor John Adams must have felt upon succeeding to the presidency to follow this man. He was Harvard educated, yet insecure, enormously ambitious, yet oddly humble. Adams is a wonderful character. I mean, you've got to love him. He's erratic. One day he's up, one day he's down. I think there may have been a little imbalance there in his system. He craved fame and power, but he always pulled himself back and said, no, I must make sacrifices for my country. Some days he thought he was on top of the world, and other days he thought he was just the lowest failure on earth. John Adams is a figure who was in many ways racked with self-doubt, at the same time enormously ambitious. Adams' personality was not suited to the presidency. John Adams certainly had the political pedigree to be president. He was a signer of the Declaration, a member of the Continental Congress, minister to France and England, and America's first vice president. And yet, as a leader of men, John Adams' management style was problematic at best. During his administration, Adams is heavily criticized for his pretentiousness as a man who was kingly in a way that George Washington never was. He was a very, very opinionated man, and he was sure that he was right and did not accept counsel as well as other presidents have. Adams was also prone to fits of anger, which he unleashed on subordinates. This is just not the way an effective executive deals with the people under him. Two issues defined Adams' presidency, the XYZ affair and the Alien and Sedition Acts. Both were caused by a crisis in foreign affairs the escalating war between England and France. By the time John Adams comes into office, the French are being particularly obnoxious. They are going through a period of seizing our shipping. 
because they don't want us trading with her enemy, Britain. Hoping to quell the crisis, Adams sent a diplomatic team to Paris. That delegation was met with the demand for a bribe. This was reported back to the American Congress. Instead of referring to the Frenchmen who demanded the bribe by their correct names, they were simply referred to as X, Y, and Z. And so this became known as the XYZ Affair. American public opinion raged against the French. Hawks screamed for war. Adams is not crazy about the French anyway. And so to be snubbed by the French like this, to be treated in effect like country bumpkins, must have offended Adams tremendously. But instead of acting impulsively, Adams kept his cool and sent a second peace delegation to Paris. For this, the warmongers in Congress vilified him. Adams had the courage to stand against these men. Indeed, he stood against most of the men in his own party, the Federalist Party. But he was firm and adamant in seeking a peaceful solution. Adams would reach his peaceful solution in 1800, when France and the United States signed the Treaty of Mortfontaine. But this wouldn't happen before Adams made the worst decision of his presidency. In the midst of our difficulties with France, there were a great many dissident voices within America. Men, newspaper editors, some politicians, who were voicing their distress with the policies of the Adams government. Acutely sensitive to criticism, Adams decided that the verbal attacks were seditious and dangerous to national security. So in 1798, Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Acts, making it a crime to falsely speak out or write against certain federal office holders, including the president. It stands out as the single greatest blemish on his otherwise extraordinary career. It fed into this image of Adams as the aristocrat, as Adams having this tinge of royalty, of arrogance. And the Alien Sedition Acts simply underscored what his enemies were already saying about this man. Sadly, Adams' support of the Alien and Sedition Acts overshadowed the treaty with France. But the importance of his diplomacy cannot be forgotten. It was a monumental achievement and one of those great turning points. For had we not made peace with France, had Adams succumbed to the pressure to go to war, the history of America would have been very, very different. Significantly, the threat of war with France was the impetus for the one legacy of Adams' presidency. John Adams is the father of the American Navy. It was Adams that understood that if America was to defend her shores, that it was necessary to have a Navy. By creating the Department of the Navy, Adams became the first U.S. president to add a secretary to his cabinet. But even the U.S. Navy could not save John Adams from himself. He had alienated many members of Congress and men of his own party. In November 1800, just after becoming the first president to live in the White House, Adams lost his bid for a second term to Thomas Jefferson. It was a bitter defeat. Adams is not gracious in defeat. The image we have today of the election of a new president, and the former president bids him welcome to the White House, etc., etc. Oh, no, not at all. Adams leaves Washington in the midst of the night. When he left office, he was certainly the most unhappy man in the country because he believed he left office disgraced and unappreciated. During his own life, John Adams' presidency was regarded as the low point of his remarkable political career. It would take nearly 200 years for historians to reassess his contribution to the office. Two presidents signed the Declaration of Independence, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Both died on July 4, 1826, the 50th anniversary of the signing. 